But the other part that I learned in the military, and I learned this from an army general, he said, you know, you don't lead demographics, you lead individuals. Mm. And I think sometimes it's very tempting for us to say, you know, millennials do this, or Gen Zers do this, or women do this, when in fact, good leadership is good leadership across the board. It's making sure you're taking care of your people, making sure you're letting them know you care about them. It's including them as part of the team. It's making people feel respected and valued and listened to at work. It's helping people see how they're part of the bigger vision and the bigger mission so that when they wake up every morning, they feel like they've got a purpose in their life. Welcome to today's version of the Keynote Curators Podcast. I'm Seth Deckman, your host, founder and president of the Keynote Curators. Our guest today is Mary Kelly, retired U.S. Naval commander, PhD in economics, business professor, author, and highly sought after keynote speaker. Our conversation covers Mary's experience in leadership in the Navy, how she draws on her research, and really how she provides great lessons on teamwork, leadership, and effective communication, and how you can best use those lessons in your personal and business life. It's a conversation you're not going to want to miss. We appreciate you being with us. Listen in. You'll be smarter for it. Hello and welcome to today's version of the Keynote Curators Podcast. I'm Seth Deckman. I'm your host and the founder and president of the Keynote Curators, where we've been providing keynote speakers for nearly 20 years to all sorts of organizations, corporations, associations, educational institutions all over the world on every imaginable topic. Today's guest is Mary Kelly. Mary, please introduce yourself. Hey, Seth, I'm Mary. Great. Mary, there's so much experience that you have through the course of your professional and personal life that has brought you to this moment. Tune our audience, our listeners in to what brought you to this moment as a keynote speaker, as a researcher, as an author as a consultant, as a trainer, that's most important for them to know. And keep in mind, as we've discussed, the majority of our listeners, as our audience grows, are meeting professionals, planners, marketers, conference organizers, and any type of vendor involved with with meeting planning. So thanks, Seth. As you know, I spent 25 years on active duty in the Navy, mostly in Asia. And while I was there, I was asked to talk to groups of people all the time which we you kind of do as a course of part of your job. My very last tour in the Navy was back teaching at the Naval Academy. And the same thing was happening. Hey, can you go talk to the FBI or go talk to Congress or go talk to whoever? And most people didn't like it. And I, as you know, really like it. So yeah. this became a thing. And then I'm in uniform, I'm doing a couple talks and another NSA member was one of the speakers. And he said, you know, you're pretty good at this. And I said, well, you are too. And he said, well, I should be. I'm a professional. I said, what? Never heard of such a thing. So I thought after I retired, I'd give this a shot. Now I had already written a couple leadership books for the Navy, which they own, they use, you know, that's a thousand people a year who have to buy a book they'll never read in all likelihood. But I also had a, a PhD in economics, so I'm very much attuned to profit growth, business development, business growth, and I grew up in a small business. I've been working trade shows, expo floor since I was seven. There's little Mary, little pigtails, writing orders. So I've been kind of doing this on and off for a long, long time. And then once I started, I was fortunate enough to meet some great bureau partners. And you gave me a great shot. A few others gave me a great shot. And then you do the associations and you do the referrals. And then it just kind of snowballs. And after, you know, your overnight success only took me about 15 years. And all of a sudden you get to be here. Right. Those overnight successes, you know, often what's so visible is Hollywood or a backup quarterback that, oh my God, the starter got hurt. And all of a sudden it was like, yeah, it's 15. That one night is 15 years of, uh, you know, preparation for that moment. Yeah. I mean, look, we, we've worked together. You, you've spoken to some of my biggest, best clients. All my clients are my best clients, but really some of my biggest high, high profile, high visibility clients and the breadth I think you cut yourself short a little bit. I know I did ask you to share what we see as most relevant, but Mary, you were the chief of police. You were a professor at the Naval Academy, a human resources director, and so much more. Uh, what are what are some of the themes that you weave through your keynotes and deliver that you you find 
most relevant, most requested, mm-hmm. and that engage and make a difference with, with groups the most? Well, you know, when I started in the Navy, we were still very much in the Cold War. And as a Cold War warrior, that was our intent. And I was an intelligence officer for several years, was looking for where the Russian submarines were, where the Chinese submarines were, where our things were, where our people were. And then when we started the first Gulf War, I was part of that intelligence gathering work as well. And then I moved into doing some counterterrorism work. And then I was a chief of police. And then I helped run a base called Pearl Harbor, which a lot of people have heard of. And then being the HR director for about 3,000 people. And in a, our mission was communications. So you know how it's a little tricky to get your internet and cable all hooked up in your house when it's a landline. Okay, now you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean and you are 2,000 miles away from a landmass and somehow we still need communication. People still think they should have email. So I managed about 3,000 HR folks from Oklahoma to the Middle East on that. So I was very lucky, Seth, because I had experience with the big things, the big people, lots of people, big logistics, lots of moving parts, big budgets. So that poised me pretty well to be in a place where when somebody says, hey, I've got $10 million problem. Okay, let's come up with a $20 million fix and something that only costs you 10% of that. So things like that, I think, were good for me in terms of being ready for certain opportunities to work with certain groups. But as you know, I'm like you. I love working with teams of all sizes. And sometimes you get an audience of 10,000 and sometimes you get 25. And the style has to be different and the interaction is different. And every single person there should feel, should feel like we're talking directly to them. And that's the goal. Yeah. And look, again, we've worked together and I've been on site with you. So I've seen it multiple times how how great you are with, and I'm not just kind of blowing smoke up, you know what, it, it really is true. What's so great is... You have a background in economics, a background in business with the entrepreneurial spirit, the structure, the discipline, the execution from the armed services. A commander in the Navy is 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 no small thing. And as you just said, you kind of weave that those themes through your keynotes. One of the things that strikes me, Mary, and I want you to underscore the importance of it and the difference that you've seen it make for groups that you present to is you're so committed to making a difference that lasts and is immediate. And that that often is in people talk about takeaways or this and that, but it's not just, we're going to leave you with three takeaways or five takeaways, or we're going to align with your corporate message, which are all important and all great, but you, you go the extra mile, you provide come here or talk to Seth and, you know, go to Seth's website or or text us and we'll get you this PDF or we'll send you this important chapter of this book that I wrote. Talk about the impact that that has. Oh, you're so nice. And I appreciate you. You know, I'm, I'm a bad audience member because I'm impatient. And if somebody says we have that, I'm like, well, I want it. And I want it right now. So as you know, we create a vault of materials for every audience. And in that And I want to underscore vault, okay? Think of Fort Knox. (laughs) It's it's hefty. And the idea is whoever you are, wherever you are, there's something in it for you. If you are the most senior person in your organization and you run an organization of 25,000, there's something in there for you. If you were hired yesterday and your job might be delivering the mail, there's something in there for you. Because I really want people, when they show up, to have a wonderful experience. And so many people, I think, they view it as a transactional thing. And you and I both know this is all about relationships. And how do we create honest relationships when you've got decent-sized crowds or bigger crowds or small crowds? Some people do better or worse. The trick is, how do you manage all of it? And as you know, I I do work really hard and I try really hard. Um, And if I ever miss it, I just, oh, there's nobody who beats themselves up more than I do. If somebody says, oh, I really didn't quite get that point or whatever, or if they go, hey, or, and it crushes me, for example, I did an event last week and somebody said, oh, I can't find this piece of material. I'm like, oh no. I mean, I actually feel a little crushed that they had a moment of frustration finding the thing. And it turns out they just, it was there. They just were clicking on something else. They didn't go further enough down the page, for example. And I think a lot of that is 
first off, I never want to disappoint your clients, but I don't want to disappoint anybody. The stakes for me have always been high. In the military, when we make a mistake, a plane goes down. When we make a mistake, somebody dies. When we make a mistake, somebody's not coming back. So a lot of our training is, first off, train like you fight. Make sure that you put everything into the preparation so that when the moment happens, you're not doing things for the first time. You're doing it for the 10th time and muscle memory kicks in and you don't have to worry when you get that oddball issue floating in. Uh, Two weeks ago, I finished talking and I'm signing books and the fire alarm goes off. We've all had this happen at least once. This wasn't even my first time the fire alarm had gone up. And if you're, if it throws you off your game, because it's happened in, in a program, if it throws you off your game, that means you didn't prepare enough. So you have to be able to just roll right into things like that. And when that happens, again, muscle memory kicks in. You train like you fight. You never want that to be your first time. And then contingency plans. As you know, I am a big fan of contingency plans. I think everything is going to go wrong. I think the AV team is not going to show up and I need all my gear. I travel with not one, but two computers because it could fail. You don't know. I travel with dongles for computers. I don't even own. I just right. I anticipate everything is going to go wrong. You're bringing, you're bringing punch cards if you have to. Oh, all the things, whatever <laughs> it takes. Because I just assume, you know, nine times out of 10, everything goes great. But that one time out of 10, you can't have that throwing you off your game. The audience can never know that there was some kind of glitch. Everything from their experience should flow well, you know, and I'm really committed to that because remember in the DOD, I was part of a meeting planner team. And when we did events, it was for heads of state. So everything had to be perfect. That was stressful. You know, you've got 10 sitting heads of states, including a U.S. president. And all of a sudden, you know, one small thing goes wrong or, you know, goodness knows somebody wanted decaf and they got caffeinated. That actually becomes a problem. So running the details, I appreciate so much my meeting planners for doing that now. Meeting pros now have to think about so many things that I didn't have to do 25 years ago when I ran meetings for DOD. And I appreciate them for all all that. And this is why I show up and I'm like, look, I work for you. You tell me to do something. It's going to happen. You need me to move chairs. I'm doing it. You need me to clean a toilet. I'm on it because we're all in this together and it has to be great. And they feel that because the ones that I've booked you for felt the partnership, the collaboration and being in it shoulder to shoulder. And, you know, you talk about your military training and train like you fight, fight like you train. It's those moments. I mean, look, the fire alarm going off, it's not a crisis, but your background has prepared you for it. What what other goals or challenges when you've had the lead teams and maybe an interesting anecdote or two that your military background has provided you the tools to be able to handle those challenges? You know, I think right now there's a lot of issues going on in the leadership space. And as you know, I talk a lot about how to lead yourself, your teams, your business through crises, challenges, and changes. We all know we're always going to have crises, challenges, and changes. It's what they look like that's just a little bit different. So COVID's an example of a crisis, but it's not the only crisis. Other people have crises all the time. Sometimes it's a personal crisis. Sometimes it's a workplace crisis. Sometimes it's a leadership shift. You and I both know that when the economy has, you know, one of those little roller coaster moments and you're working in financial planning, all of a sudden, lots of people get very, very excited. And for them, it looks like a crisis. So we have to figure out ways and we have to know how to deal with not just ourselves during a crisis, challenge or a change, but also with other people. And when, you know, COVID hit, I had mapped out what I thought were these six stages, why it was so hard for some people during a situation, a tough time, and not so hard for other people. Because you and I both know lots of people just struggled in 2020. Yeah. They yeah. just they just struggled. Yeah. And I would tell folks it's because when people are threatened by something, and I saw it, I saw it in combat, I see it day to day with my civilian friends. You know, let's say your family member suddenly gets a terrible diagnosis. That's all you think about when you are, and that's a crisis, also a change and a challenge, but it's a crisis. All you think about is that thing. And in the first four stages of a crisis or a challenge or a change, it's all about us. We're very myopic. It's our job, our family, our kids, our homeschooling, our community, our network, our whatever. It's very, very myopic. And especially if it's serious, you become so laser-like focused on just that thing that's impacting you, you can't see anything else. 
And I remember, as you as um, you and some of your friends know, my Marine Corps husband um, died of multiple myeloma from Agent yeah. Orange from Vietnam. And I remember walking out of that hospital, Seth, and looking around, and I was just stunned that the rest of the world was going on like, yeah. like normal. And I thought, oh, yeah, the rest of the world doesn't really care about my crisis. Right. You know? And you know what? I would even say they don't even know. Of course they don't, because they've right. their own lives. Like they don't they even know lives. to to not care. You you know what I mean? Yeah, like it's even more agno- It's even more like neutral than that. Yeah. Right. Kids are playing yeah. ball in the park, and people are having their coffees, and the world is going on. And all of a sudden, I realized, you know what? When we become that myopic, we kind of stop seeing the rest of the world. And yeah. that was a, that was a really good lesson for me. Also, kind of a kick in the head. Yeah. And when I looked, so when I crafted the first four stages of them being very myopic, and I explain it to people, I say, you know what? You've moved on to stage five, which is the new reality, and then very quickly into stage six, which is how you're going to realign your efforts to figure out what you do next. But a lot of people can't. And when they are threatened, when they feel fearful, when they are that focused on what they've got to deal with, they can't focus on other things. So we have to lead them out of that space. So the military did, happily enough, give me good opportunities to deal with crises, challenges, and changes. We change things all the time. You're on, you know, you're deployed and all of a sudden they go, you know how you thought you were going home next week because you've been gone for six months? Yeah, you're going to be here for another two months. And all of a sudden you're missing things like weddings and births and Christmas and all of that. And you have to be able to be flexible. And this is where I think the military training was so helpful to me because you have to be able to flex. You have to not just manage your own disappointment, but now I got it to all my people. Uh, we're going to be here for another two months. And you can't say, oh, the boss is terrible and this is terrible and you know everything's bad. You can't do that. You have to say, you know what? We we're all looking forward to this and now things have changed. And we're all professional. And this is what I expect from you. This is what I need from you. And this is how we're going to get through this together. Like you have to take the situation and manage the situation, the good, the bad, the indifferent, all of that. Right. You have to, you have to be the frankness, the the honesty required to assess what's so, and then operate and deploy from your assessment of what's going on. There's there's a lot to unpack there, Mary. Have you been able to uh, distill it's a little bit of a setup question here. You know, there's common, you and I have talked about this, whether it's teamwork, whether it's leadership, some of the common mistakes, whether you're lower down on the rung, middle manager, supervisor, CEOs, that even if they, they're, it's unintentional, that disrupts a team's rhythm, their effectiveness, their productivity, that you've been able to provide impactful difference making um, ideas that, that they can shifted to a different place. As you know, I did, one of my books is called Why Leaders Fail and the Seven Prescriptions for Success. And to prep that book who I, that I co-wrote with Peter Stark, we surveyed over a hundred thousand people. And I had my own ideas on why sometimes leaders fail or were challenged or just couldn't figure things out, but I wanted actual data. 100,000 responses. And then we taxonomized it. And it was interesting to me how sometimes the littlest things would make just catastrophic problems for the organization and for the teams. Um, So there's the second chapter is all about trust and how trust can be, it's assumed until you lose it. And it doesn't take that much to lose it. And the number one thing that causes people to lose trust is, well, it stems from communication, but when people say, yeah, I'll get back to you and then they don't, or I'll do that for you. And then they don't, or small things like they hear part of a story and they assume they know the rest of it. I had one situation where his people thought he was stealing from the organization. And I was like, stealing? That's an awfully strong word. Yeah. Talk about, you know, somebody at the top. The perception was, was golfing every Wednesday afternoon. He wasn't golfing on Wednesday afternoons. He was at a CEO forum that met every Wednesday afternoon because he was a really good guy and he wanted to do a great job for his team, but he didn't want them to think he didn't have all the answers. So on Wednesday afternoons from one to four, it just said blocked for meetings. So people just thought he was golfing. Mm. So once we figure that out, you know, because not, not everyone's defaults are the same. And especially when people are stressed, they will oftentimes default to the negative. 
and we've seen we see this all the time when people yeah. read about something they go well you know it's just because of fill in the blank whatever the current stressor is that becomes the default cause of the problem and i saw this happen a lot it's little things that a lot of our leaders struggle with some of our leaders they have a vision but they don't convey that to their teams some leaders are great with people but not all people just people like them that becomes problematic they don't know how to adapt their communication style to other people. And as a result, they're sometimes interpreted as being rude or brusque or overly wordy. That can be an issue too. We also know that some, some leaders try to protect their people's privacy. This happens a lot in the medical world. And all of a sudden, people will construe that as they're not fair. They're not a fair leader. And so because, you know, I'm getting this and I don't see the big picture, they construe that in a different way. Right. And what I tell people, my leaders is, look, share more information than you think you need to share. Be more transparent with your team. People can handle bad news. What they can't handle is being kept in the dark. And, you know, that uncertainty preys on that. And if you've ever had a, a kid and they come home late and you say, yeah, we'll deal with this in the morning. You know, they're thinking about it all night long because they're nervous. That uncertainty preys on us. Right. And I learned this from being in the military. You know, it's better to tell people that, look, I got some, I got some good news. I got some bad news and I got some, this is how we're going to deal with the news right. and let people know what's going on. People will rise up to our expectations. And sometimes we got to just assume the best. Um, back when I deployed, we would use letters because email hadn't been invented yet. Remember letters, <laughs> postage? I, I do. I, I think do. postage is like 62 or 63 cents now. It's kind of crazy. But sometimes you'd miss a letter or a package of letters or you'd miss something. And that's your only communication back and forth. And sometimes it would take weeks. It is so easy to misconstrue things when it's just a quick, hey, I don't have time for a whole lot. Well, why don't you have time? What are you doing that you don't have time to pay attention to me? I mean, all of the uncertainty. So our rule was, if there's more than one way to interpret something, default to the good. Default to the way that assumes the best intent from other people. And I see some people today kind of struggling with that idea, just assuming the best of other people. And why, why do you think they're struggling with that? I just, my observation is this, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it, because my father used to say, who was in, he was, his veteran was in Korea, you know, when now? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like a very simple philosophy, unless, you know, there were situations that warranted, justified, that was corresponded not to deal with it. You know, if you're over anxious or, or hurried and doesn't correspond to, to do it right now, but basically like, look, it's raining or the road is closed. I'm family road trip. You know, it's going to be seven hours instead of four hours. Let us know. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's when now. So my thing is, I'm of the school of thought and I share it with you, communicate whether I, I have a not great news for a client, somebody's not available, or there's a request for some change that might create some problems with the agenda, but there's also the way in which you communicate it, right? There's an art form to it without overthinking it, but without being cavalier and then taking into consideration, you know, today, how do you communicate? I call it smartphone short. Mm -hmm right? Get to the heart of the matter, and but do it in a responsible way. And communicate more than you think you need to. You know, most of us think we're good at communication and we'd be wrong. Statistically, the average, we're not, we're not better. We're average. It's like driving. Most people think they're really good drivers. Most people are just <laughs> average drivers, let's face it. And for example, I did a, an event last week and it was a day and a half masterclass on leadership for a group of medical professionals. Now, they brought me in last year to do this. They brought me back in again this year. They've never had anybody else, but I need them to know. And I told them afterwards, and it was great. And they got good testimonials and people are happy. Yay. And that's what I want. But I also had to tell them, I said, look, I think you should do this every year. And that means that's not going to be me every year. And it may be, we may have one more year of this. We may not. I said, but I need you to know I am really okay with you bringing somebody else in because this core group of people needs to continue on their learning path. And maybe bringing me in two years in a row was good momentum, but maybe somebody else in the future is going to be great. Don't get me wrong. I adore you and I adore these people. And when you want recommendations for other people, I will be happy to brainstorm with you on who would be great for your clients, because I want them to be successful. And I want the audience to have wonderful experiences, even if it's not me. And so just telling them that, because now they're like, 
it's kind of like, okay, you've been out on a date with me twice. Now do we have to ask Mary out again? You know, I never want people to feel like it's weird. Sure. There's lots of talent out there and I want to make sure it is the right talent for that event, even if it's not me. So like, Hey, I need you to know I'm okay with this and I will help you find somebody else who's going to be awesome. And you know, that disarming, I don't know if the word is disarming or that level of, of direct straightness. You know, another thing my dad said was be straight in your communication and take what you get. And I used to hear take what you get kind of is resigned. No, it's take what you get and then operate off of what you get. If you're in the red in your bank account, you know, you can't avoid it. You got to take what you got and then work with it. So in this case, maybe you're this client who does want you three years in a row would come back in a different context and say, Hey, I know you recommended, I might not be the one. What are your concerns with that? And how can we create a new context to have you come back? Because you're connected, you're related with the group. We know you have more content. We want the through line to continue. And then there's collaboration based on your honesty and direct communication. It opens up a whole new kind of panorama. And I think part of that is being okay with what the answer is. And part of me was expecting them to go, we're so glad you raised that because we do know we need to shake it up for next year. They didn't say that, but I was expecting them to say that, you know, right. and maybe they were thinking it, but you know, if somebody's thinking it and it's creating uncertainty or it's causing them to pause, I would much rather somebody go, Mary, you're, you know, we like you a lot, but, and yeah. then I will help you find somebody else. I want great communication and I want, I want to hear it. I want it to be straight. And I think a lot of people struggle with communication, especially now, because we're not always sure how it's going to be received. And for some people, you might be dealing with somebody's ego or a team issue or something yeah. else or the boss. The, in this case, I know the boss is comfortable with me, but the boss also needs to be comfortable with other talent out there. That's right. That's right. Keeping on the teamwork, the leadership and... Um, and, you know, I'm just curious, you know, we're kind of of the same vintage, you know, and, and the sands are always shifting as far as demographics, where society's focus is. I've heard historians, political scientists call it China century. I personally, from my perch, and I'm partial, Mary, I have three daughters. It's the century of the women in my mind. And a little known fact I learned, if you take only the gold medals that women's U.S. Olympic team won in the last five Summer Olympics, they would have come in second as a nation, just the women, just to give you a sense of the volume of the impact that they have, right? So who in society, uh, business, anywhere, what Women leaders inspire you, are inspiring you, draw your attention. You can glean uh, great lessons from. Women now have more opportunities than we ever have, ever. From the beginning of humans walking upright, we have more opportunities now than we ever have, which also gives us the responsibility to not waste those opportunities. I am wildly grateful to the women who went before me at the Naval Academy, the women who were the first class to go into the Naval Academy, because that had to be a little bit rough. And you have to remember when you're 17 or 18 years old, you don't kind of realize what that impact is. And I was in the eighth class. So you don't really realize that that's still kind of a social experiment. But there are so many great women leaders out there right now. And by the way, the one I want to meet is Condoleezza Rice. If anybody knows her, you can introduce me to her. I would really just like a two minute conversation with her. I think she's brilliant and smart and strategic and clever and funny, and she's everything I want to be. So I think right now we're so fortunate to be in this time where we do have more opportunities and we have to make sure we don't waste those opportunities on things that don't matter. And you know me, Seth, sometimes I get a little bit too serious about work. I try to be funny on the platform, but I take work very, very seriously. Yes. And it's, you know, it's partly because I want to make sure, and I've heard it before, I still get it. You know, you're the first female speaker we've ever hired. I still yeah. get it. And yeah. I have to, and so in my mind, that's a big responsibility. Okay. All right. Well, there's, there's a lot of really good female speakers out there. And I want to make sure that after I finish this year, that you think positively about how that experience was and that I represent my, I guess my gender in a good way. I don't know. But the other part that I learned in the military, and I learned this from an army general, he said, you know, you don't lead demographics, you lead individuals. 
Mm. And I think sometimes it's very tempting for us to say, you know, millennials do this or Gen Zers do this or women do this, when in fact, good leadership is good leadership across the board. It's making sure you're taking care of your people, making sure you're letting them know you care about them. It's including them as part of the team. It's making people feel respected and valued and listened to at work. It's helping people see how they're part of the bigger vision and the bigger mission so that when they wake up every morning, they feel like they've got a purpose in their life. It's being that leader that when somebody has a bad time or they're going through a rough spot, they can call you up and say, hey, I'm kind of going through a rough time. Do you have any advice or can I just talk? That's what great leadership is. And it's helping people do the things you know they need to do, but it's also being that exemplary person so that when things get tough, they know that they can rely on you. Yeah. I mean, it's coming from you, it just sounds so potent, so clear and concise. And I don't want to belittle it by any means, but the simplicity of it, being there for for people, hey, how are you doing? I might be reading the situation wrong. You seem a little bit off. No, no, no. I have an upset stomach. Or you know what? I got some really bad news about a, f- a close family member. And you know, and a leader would come in as as you've taught me and lean in and say, "Look, if you'll permit me, I'm here for you. When you, if you're not now, I'm open. I'm ready. I'm accessible." And those, you know, I don't love the word soft skill, but that interhuman connection is so important in leadership. And I know you impart that whether it's on the pre-event call at the sound check, on stage, afterwards, follow-ups, um, you, you bring that um, and you demonstrate that leadership and that, that connection with my clients. And, and I appreciate you for that. Mary, we're going to head into the finish line here. We're going to turn the corner a little bit and have what we've been doing here this year in 2023 is 20 questions, a rapid fire kind of questions. Are you ready? Ready. All righty. What's the most interesting thing about you that we wouldn't learn from your resume? All my books have their own wine label. Uh, You know, we've been talking for a while and I was wondering when you were going to work wine into the conversation and it was at the most appropriate time. That's great. What's one of your favorite books? The Competent Leader by Peter Stark. It's absolutely brilliant. What's the greatest risk you've ever taken? Ooh, greatest risk. I started a marathon and the longest I'd ever run before that was about eight miles. And I was doing it mostly to show up my future husband's past girlfriend. (laughs) Determination goes a long way. Boy, doesn't it? (laughs) I finished. (laughs) Yeah. What are three things that bring a smile to your face? Ooh, dogs, wine, and my amazing friends to hang out with. That was the other one I was waiting for, dogs. I I knew it was there right at the surface, but you just brought it in at the appropriate time. What's a skill you don't have, but you wish you did? Oh, I wish I could fly. Is that a skill? I don't know. Okay. So that might might be a little lofty, but I wish I could touch type. I went to all the classes. I did Mavis Brown. I did all those things. I can't touch type. I'm a really fast two finger typist, but I do think if I could touch type, I could, I could accomplish more. And I'd like that. Yeah. You, you come from the school of my daughters, the two, two finger typing. Will we see a few more presidents soon? Will we see what? A female president soon. Ooh, I have no idea. Again, I don't think gender is as important as as capacity. Okay. What are you most grateful for in life? I am so grateful for being alive each and every day. I do not take any day for granted. I need you to know that I wake up just happy and cheerful and grateful every single day. Every, Every time I get to wake up, I'm grateful. What's next on your bucket list? I am going to- Other other than Condoleezza Rice two-minute conversation. Condoleezza Rice, two minutes. Anybody. I am very lucky that my Naval Academy classmates, one of my classmates, has put together a mid-reunion cruise. And so there's going to be a couple hundred of us who are going to go on a cruise to Alaska. And it's just going to be really, really fun to experience Alaska and a cruise with a couple hundred of your closest friends. I think that's going to be a blast. I can't imagine being the crew on that cruise. With a ship full of, (laughs) with a ship you have to worry about. Yeah, with the ship full of the naval. Yeah, well, stay on course, so to speak. What do you wish civilians understood about military life? I wish they understood that work is not an eight to five job. Work is twenty four seven. Leadership is twenty four seven. That if you're doing it right, it's all encompassing, and there is no there. 
there is no such thing as work-life balance. There just isn't. And some days are better than others. You just have to accept that as part of the equation, that what we do is important and it requires a lot of sacrifice. Um, And then translating that into the civilian world, for me, it's easy when somebody says, you know, we're doing this, it's East Coast time, it's going to be 6 a.m. I'm like, yep, I can be up for my time. It's not a big deal at all. Because there's just not that perception. Oh, it's eight to five. Oh, my big pet peeve, it's not my job. Oh, Oh, makes me crazy. You know, the the nails on the chalkboard, right? Mm -hmm. What's the most, most beautiful thing in the world you can think of? Ooh, the most beautiful thing in the world. I'm going to go with a landscape and I would have to say New Zealand. Um, All of New Zealand really does look like Lord of the Rings, except that whole Mordor thing. Um, (laughs) And every time you drive around New Zealand, it's just the most beautiful place ever. So I'm going to go with a place. Um, Some people I'm sure are saying, oh, my daughter smile. I don't have any daughters, Um, you know, whatever. But I'm going to go with landscape. Yeah, I bet. I've had the good fortune of being there twice and it is just every wind in the road or footpath, the river, it's just coastline. It really is, it is breathtaking. Well, Mary, we're going to finish it there in a beautiful New Zealand landscape and you on a Alaskan cruise with your hundreds of closest friends. I just thank you so much for, you know, sharing your story, sharing your insights, your leadership ideas, and for the clients that you've spoken to um, in the past and the ones that you're going to speak to on my behalf in the future. Just thank you for the work you do. I know it's easy to thank you uh, for the obvious stuff, the great presentation, the great handouts, the great takeaways, but I know you're burning the midnight oil. I know you're in the airport early, checking in all the late nights in the hotels and the food isn't, you know, always exactly awesome. And, you know, you never get thanked for those kind of things. So thank you for that as well. Oh, I love every bit of it. I love it. You know, when the planes fly, we travel. I love being on the road, as you know, and I get to go to different places, see new people, do all the things. Um, You know, Stephen Pressfield says, once you figure out what you're born to do, then you have to pursue it and everything that comes with it. And I'm just so fortunate to be able to work with you and your team and um, y'all get me out on the road and I love it. So thank you. You're welcome. Alrighty, that concludes today's episode of the Keynote Curators. Today we had our special guest, Mary Kelly. We appreciate you being with us for listening in. We know you're smarter for it. Thank you very much. If you'd like to learn more about this speaker, visit our website at thekeynotecurators.com. There you'll find dozens of videos of speakers that are a perfect fit for your event. If you'd like to reach out directly, please click on the link below in the description. My name is Seth Deckman, and you've been watching Curated Insights.